Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. I even love the smell of books. Hello, welcome to a Sundaku mini-sode with me, Annie Hastwell. And today I'll be introducing you to first-time author Molly Schmidt. Molly is from rural WA, and her novel Salt River Road is not just poetic, it moves between poetry and prose as it takes the reader on a journey through grief and then redemption. There are lots of ups and downs. We not only find ourselves inside the minds of the characters, but also in the unique landscape of the Southwest. Salt River Road deals with a very intense time in the lives of one family, the Tetleys. I spoke to Molly Schmidt just before the book was released late last year, and I asked her to describe the family and what's happening to them when we meet them. The Tetleys are a big family uh, that are living in regional WA on a farm um, in the late 1970s. And the main characters in focus are teenage siblings, Rose and Frank Tetley. So Rose is 16 and Frank 17, and they were born a year apart on the same day. So they're almost twins, um, which is quite important through the book. And the reader meets them, the Tetleys, as they're coming to terms with losing their mum, Eleanor, to terminal cancer. And everything is just going to ruins around them. They're not coping. They're living on a sheep farm and the poor sheep are walking around unshorn with last year's wool on. No one really knows how to talk about what's happened or how to support each other. And it's, yeah, kind of that moment that the reader meets the Tetleys. Mm, And I like the way you move from one of the Tetley siblings to the other to just Mm. get the feeling of how differently they are all affected but how totally torn apart they are. And the funeral terribly untidy funeral because nobody can deal with it and the father can't deal with it either just describe him at the funeral I thought that was particularly sad yeah so Rose and Frank's dad is called Eddie and he he is a sad character he's sort of muted by his grief he he is kind of lost to the children as well because he withdraws so strongly Um, at the funeral he so they have two. There's one in their local community in Tenterden, and he struggles at both. The other one's in the city in Perth with Eleanor's extended family, and Eddie feels like he sticks out like a sore thumb. He's a farmer. He's, you know, got one good suit, and he accidentally wears his farm boots, and he's trailing dust all over the place, and the rest of the, you know, congregation are there in their fancy tailored black clothes, and some of them don't know who he is. And, yeah, he just doesn't cope. He drinks um, too much and ultimately actually vomits on Eleanor's mum, so his mother-in-law. And, yeah, it it just doesn't go well. He doesn't – he's not able to maintain his role as the father of the family because he's so stuck with his grief. It's a very strong picture of grief and I like the way you've used both poetry and prose – to get that across because sometimes when things are deeply emotional, poetry is a much better way, isn't it, to mm. to try and explain how you're feeling. Yeah, that's what I found, that I really naturally wrote um, emotional scenes in poetry, sort of um, verse poems, so they're not really structured and they're a bit chaotic, um, but that was just how those scenes would come to me and initially I wasn't sure if ultimately I needed to write them into prose and edit them into, you know, a more traditional (laughs) book style. Um, But it was, yeah, what ended up, what I sort of ended up leaning into and wrote more of the poetry. So the the poems are also kind of an insight into Rose and Frank's inner feelings that they might not have the awareness of themselves to actually coherently think in the prose. It's a terribly sad time. It's shockingly sad. And as the story travels on, I don't know about other readers, but for me, Frank, uh, Mm. he was the one that I worried about most. He really goes downhill, doesn't he? Give us some idea of, you know, how his life falls apart. Yeah, so Frank, gosh, I love him. It's, It's funny how as a writer you come to love your characters, but he's so misunderstood and he's messy and he can be really mean and nasty. He goes completely off the rails. So where Rose 
tries to pull up her socks and fill the gap that her mum's left to the best of her ability. She still mucks up a bit too, but Frank... Um, Just loses it, doesn't he? Yeah, he steals and drinks and smokes pot consistently and doesn't eat and, yeah, he he's worrying. You're, you're right. His behaviour is concerning and um, there's so much going on and there's so many Tetleys that no one really notices just how much he's in crisis, which really lets him fall through the gaps and get into some pretty dire situations. Now, as you say, the family's falling apart, the farm is falling apart, and we get a picture of the landscape and the social milieu that they all inhabit. There's racism and there's a sense that to some people the Tetleys are white trash. So it's not an easy place to live, is it? No, not at all. And some of that was really interesting and why I chose to write it um, in the late 70s as well because some of those um, issues that are still very much around today just seem to be particularly highlighted in that sort of era as well. And, yeah, Rose and Frank, although they are white, they, they don't quite fit either. Now, the people that come into the story are the <coughs> Noongar elders, Patsy and Herbert, who have their own mm. history with Rose's parents. Can you talk a little bit about them and how the story starts to sort of change and move away from this intense sadness when that element enters? Patsy and Herbert are Noongar elders, so... Rose and Frank both meet them individually of each other, um, but around the same point in the novel. And the the elders sort of become like grandparent figures for both of them. And they represent this guidance and this care and, you know, softness that the neither of the teenagers are getting anywhere else. And yeah, Patsy and Herbert have a really complex past with Rose and Frank's dad. And all of that is sort of brought to the light when they come into Rose's life. They pick her up. Um, She's trying to hitchhike her way away from all of the grief and trauma and is walking along the road. And they pick her up and drop her back off at her farm. And it's the first time they've been there in, you know, probably over a decade. And the reader starts to realise that Auntie Patsy and Uncle Herbert have a long history and something's going on here that also needs resolving. And, yeah, without giving anything away, I suppose that's the parallel narrative that shifts the book out of just this story of grief and loss and into some hope and ultimately reconciliation. Now, you lost your own father to cancer. How much of that experience is in the book and how hard was it to write about that? It's sort of start, middle and end of the book. It's enormous. Um, and it's it's why the whole book happened and... Um, what I did with my feelings really um so it was it was really hard to write a lot of it but it was also um a healing tool for me because I started writing as a teenager myself I was bang on the same age as Rose when I started writing the story and these characters down and I'd lost my dad about six years earlier I was about 10 when he died to terminal cancer And, yeah, I think it was my way of um, exploring how I felt and what happened and grieving and making sense of it all, but without having to have the immediacy of writing about myself. So, Mm. What part of your subconscious did the Tetleys spring from then or were they part of your life growing up there? No, so they weren't at all, but Rose and Frank and then the tribe of the other brothers kind of I think represented what I was yearning for. I'm an only child, so I was facing my loss sort of on my own in that sense and with my mum who, you know, was incredibly supportive and a big part of my story too, but I didn't have those siblings to work it out with and so I suppose I kind of wrote, excuse me, the siblings that I didn't have and explored it with them, which I think is where Rose and Frank came from. Mm, It's a really lovely way of kind of rewriting your own pain, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the book does take an arc and it goes from grief to healing and in more ways than just the kids recovering from their mother's death. When you decided to write a novel that actively pursues reconciliation, why was that also something you cared about so deeply? Yeah, so that was the point where the book did, even for me, change from being just a work of therapy into something else. And it was after, um, you know, I, I work as a journalist and have had the privilege of working with some of the Noongar community where I'm from in storytelling in that sense. And it just really struck me that I had written this book that's set in my hometown and 
not included any characters that are Noongar and that didn't feel inclusive and I didn't feel comfortable with that fact, but I also didn't know how to get it right or what to do. So, um, yeah, I ended up going back to uni and doing a thesis project that was directly looking at how to include Indigenous characters as a non-Indigenous writer. And through that, ended up spending two years consulting directly with elders from my hometown in Albany and just sitting down and asking them, initially not even how, but if, as a non-Indigenous writer, they wanted a local book to include their people. And I'm very conscious that this answer would be different for language groups and people across Australia. But in this particular case, these elders all really did want a local book to reference them. So, Mm. yeah, together we worked out the scope of how. And, yeah, the connection with them and what I learned from them just grew in a way that I could never have expected but became not only the end of the book but just an enormous connection for me as well. Also the landscape is very much part of that connecting because the grandfather, who's a bit of a grim character and certainly Mm. quite racist it seems, we don't see much of him, he's off off stage so to speak, but Mm -hmm. um, he has a deep interest in plants. Eleanor, the mother who died, she was a very keen botanist and writer about plants and then Auntie Patsy does the most beautiful painting so it all sort of pulls together an Indigenous view of the land plus what Elena and her father have brought to the same topic. Mm, Was that coincidental or is that something you set out to do at the beginning? No there's a couple of things with the book I'm aware it sort of sounds cliche but in this case because the book took you know, so long and was sort of in the background of my life for such a long time, I didn't have an active plan as to what was happening. (laughs) And I'd Mm. often just sit down and write. And I think the first part of that was Eleanor, before I'd done the research and before I'd include the Noongar characters, had always come to me as someone who loved plants and botany and things. And then Patsy just did paint. And yeah, it just sort of I don't know, I'm sure you've had other writers say it too and experience it yourself, but some things kind of just tell you what's happening. Mm, Very interesting. And what has the local Noongar community thought of the book? Have you had a bit of a reaction? So I've had response from the elders that I worked with and that's been beautiful and, you know, they, I mean, they love the final product, which I feel really, really, really honoured and lucky to be able to say. But I suppose what's more interesting there is... um, how they felt during the back and forth because I would bring them sections that I'd written and we'd sit down and work out, okay, does this work? Do you feel comfortable with how I've done this? And there were certain things that we did change along the way and that they did direct that really shaped the final outcome. So they're happy, but I'm really excited to to see how it's received by the rest of the community for sure. Mm, Is there a local launch planned? Yes, so I'm actually driving. So I live in Fremantle, which is five hours from my hometown in Albany, and I'm literally hitting the road tomorrow morning. And the local launch is on the Saturday night um, with the elders and one of the elders who is so dear to me, Uncle Lester. Um, he plays in a country cover band, and they're um, they're going to play the songs that are referenced throughout the book. Because there's a big sort of rock and roll. The soundtrack. Yeah. I so felt like it was a book with playing. a soundtrack with them. Absolutely. And so vivid for anyone who knows those very familiar songs of the 70s. Yeah, I'm glad. That was very much the intention. Author Molly Schmidt talking about her debut novel, Salt River Road. And that launch she was talking about is well behind her now. The book is on the shelves and it's just made the shortlist for the Indie Book Awards. They'll be announced in late March. Salt River Road is published by Fremantle Press. And that's it for this mini-sode of Sundaku, the podcast for voracious readers everywhere. When I can gather the rest of the team back from holidays and other duties, we'll be back with you to talk poetry, among other things, and also to take a look at the bevy of writers heading for the Adelaide Festival Writers' Week. Thanks for your company today. I'm Annie Hastwell.
Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.